Thank you. Morning, everyone. Today I'm presenting on achondroplasia. Uh, so by way of overview, just going to be talking about the background etiology and diagnosis and then the manifestations, both non-orthopedic and orthopedic. So achondroplasia is the most common skeletal dysplasia and accounts for 90% of cases of disproportionate short stature. There's an incidence of 1 in 30,000 live births annually and a global prevalence of between 1 in 9 cases per 100,000 globally. The term achondroplasia means without cartilage formation and the term was first used by Paro in 1878 to distinguish the condition from rickets. It's characterised uh, by a number of features. These include foramen magnum stenosis, thoracolumbar kyphosis, spinal stenosis, genuvarum and short stature, as well as several other features we can see on this diagram here, including macrocephaly with frontal bossing, so broad forehead, mid-face hyperplasia, rhizomelia, so the proximal portion of the limb being shorter than the distal portion, brachydactyly, so short digits. <clears throat> In terms of etiology, uh, the inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant, but 80% of cases are actually sporadic. Mutations uh, are due to uh, changes in the gene, in, sorry, mutations in the gene encoding fibroblast growth factors of the 3 or FGFR3 on chromosome 4 are responsible. And most typical features. Um, have the same recurrent mutation, which is actually a gain of function mutation. And this results in the inhibition of chondrocyte proliferation and differentiation. Clinically, this presents as underdevelopment and shortening of the long bones, which have been formed by endochondral ossification due to, if it's, due to its effect on the physis. So the diagnosis is based off clinical and radiographic features. So things that can be noted on a skeletal survey include narrowing of the interparticulate distance from L1 to L5 on AP lumbar spine radiographs. Uh, and this is characteristic, but is not present in all patients. Undeveloped facial bones, skull base and foramen magnum. Squaring of the iliac wings. Rhizolemic shortening and flared metaphysis of the long bones an inverted V shape of the distal femoral physis with a normal epiphysis. Uh, the diagnosis can be confirmed with molecular genetic testing for FGFR3 mutation. And this is indicated uh, for patients with an atypical presentation or to distinguish it uh, from similar disorders such as hypochondroplasia or pseudoachondroplasia. So uh, here are some the uh, one on the left demonstrating that change in interparticulate distance from L1 to L5, and on the right, the V shaped distal femoral physis. Um, we can see there. So, the clinical manifestation in terms of non orthopedic manifestations, uh, hydrocephalus can be seen. Uh, infants should have their head circumference closely monitored and uh, as well as their motor development to check for any delays. Ventricular shunting is needed in uh, approximately 5% of patients with achondroplasia. Otolaryngeal manifestations can also be seen. So 90% of uh, children with achondroplasia have otitis media before the age of two, and approximately half of those uh, require tympanostomy tubes. Uh, there are also developmental uh, milestones being delayed. So uh, generally, achondroplastic children uh, achieve unaided walking by 17 months as opposed to 12 to 16 months in healthy children. Moving on to the orthopedic manifestations. So foramen magnum stenosis, uh, this is the first spinal manifestation in development and most commonly occurs during the first two years of life. It's responsible for the higher mortality rate of between two and 5% that's seen in infants with achondroplasia. The most common presenting symptom being respiratory difficulty with snoring uh, or apnea, and it can lead to severe developmental delay. Uh, CT 
or MRI are recommended for screening for foramen magnum stenosis in all infants with achondroplasia. In more severe cases with central sleep apnea, cord compression or neurologic deficit, they require foramen magnum decompression with an upper cervical laminectomy with or without duroplasty. Uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis, so newborns with achondroplasia typically have a kyphosis of 20 degrees. When sitting begins, the child then often slumps forward due to a combination of factors such as trunk hypotonia and an oversized head with chest. Repeated slumping then results in a gentle kyphosis from T10 to L4 uh, with or without anterior vertebral wedging. Most of these tend to resolve at 12 to 18 months as trunk strength improves in the child uh, to tr help try and prevent uh, the kyphosis um, children under one year. In children under one year, parents are advised to avoid unsupported sitting and prohibit sitting up more than 60 degrees. Um, bracing is indicated if the kyphosis develops a fixed component of greater than 30 degrees substantial anterior wedging or posterior displacement of the vertebra at the apex. So a thoracolumbar, thoracolumbosacral orthosis or TLSO is worn until the child is walking independently. The anterior corners of the vertebrae reconstitute and the fixed component of the curve stops improving. There are some downsides to bracing, however, there is a risk of falls due to having a large brace on a small body with poor trunkal control. Um, it can have a detrimental effect as well on pulmonary function as these children already have uh, small chests and often pre-existing uh, respiratory difficulties. If bracing fails, uh, the options then include use of hyperextension casting or surgical management. Indications for surgery include neurologic compromise or kyphoses of greater than 50 degrees due to the risk of progression to a rigid kyphosis. Generally, uh, it's recommended to try and delay uh, any surgery until four years of age so that the child is large enough to allow for instrumentation unless the kyphosis is rapidly progressing. So the surgical options include posterior fusion with instrumentation or combined anterior posterior fusion, depending on the degree of kyphosis. Uh, the addition of corpectomy may be required if there's severe cord impingement on MRI. <laughs> Patients can also have lumbosacral hyperlordosis, and this is present, present in 80% of children with achondroplasia. It's a result of excessive anterior pelvic tilt while standing, which produces a prominent abdomen and buttocks with hip flexion contractures. Typically, uh, the, the children are asymptomatic of this and don't require treatment, and the indications for treatment themselves are quite poorly defined. Uh, it's recommended to have physiotherapy focusing on lower back and lower abdominal strengthening. Uh, Non-surgical treatment with solar stretching has been tried without great success. Uh, these patients also develop spinal stenosis and there are multiple morphological ab abnormalities which pre predispose them to this. Uh, so they have shortened vertebral bodies which are enlarged at the superior and inferior aspects. They have short and thickened pedicles, so they're 30% 30, 30 uh, thicker, the pedicles in children with achondroplasia. Uh, they have reduced interpediculate distance between L1 to L5, as we alluded to earlier, increased pedicle diameter. And they have hyperplastic intervertebral discs and lig ligamentum flavum. Uh, the combination of this results in a 40% reduction in size, in the size of the sagittal and coronal diameters of the spinal canal when compared with healthy patients. Symptomatic spinal stenosis usually presents in the third to fourth decade. Um, however, it can occasionally present before adolescence as well. 
and the reported incidence in, in patients with achondroplasia is between 37 to 89%. So approximately one quarter of all, pa all achondroplasia patients will require surgery for spinal stenosis. The indications for this include progressive symptoms, urinary retention, severe neurogenic claudication, and neuro neurological symptoms at rest. So the, the surgery is multi-level laminectomy with fusion, um, but it presents a number of challenges. The nerve root recesses themselves must be explored as lateral stenosis is common. So a laminectomy alone is insufficient for decompression. The uh, surgery should extend three levels above the myelographic block and below to at least the level of S2 due to the high risk of recurrence. And the, the pedicle screws themselves are technically challenging in these patients. The pedicles are directed cranially, they're 10 millimeters shorter on average, and they have a smaller sagittal diameter. Uh, in terms of the upper extremity, uh, these patients have rhizomelic shortening, secondary to short humeri. So their fingertips often only reach to their greater trochanters, which means difficulty in reaching the top of the head or perineum for hygiene. The disability may be exacerbated by flexion contractures of the elbows with or without radial head subluxation. And characteristically, they have an extra space between their third and fourth rays, which gives three groups and a trident appearance to the hand. It's going to be seen in this photograph here. Um, upper, upper extremity lengthening can be considered if required to maintain activities of daily living. Um, however, there are, there are risks of complications, which we'll discuss in the lower limb section. Uh, genuvarum is also seen. This can be asymptomatic or associated with pain, instability, waddling gait, or lateral gapping of the knee when standing. Um, the, the cause hasn't been completely agreed on, but hypotheses include lateral collateral ligament laxity and fibular overgrowth. The fibula is nearly always longer than the tibia in patients with achondroplasia. Non-operative management involves symptomatic treatment. Um, bracing has generally been found to be unsuccessful. Uh, indications for surgery in, include um, the need for correcting a symptomatic deformity, uh, fibula thrust or severe malalignment. This can be done with a tibial or femoral osteotomy. Uh, it can be closing or opening wedge uh, with internal fixation or an X-fix. It's important to note that um, concurrent tibial torsion issues must be addressed. So often um, patients with achondroplasia have decreased external tibial torsion and a lack of normal decrease in the femoral antiversion during growth. Uh, procedures that address the fibula alone, such as partial excisional osteotomy and fibular epiphysiodesis have been advocated, but the efficacy hasn't been established. Uh, short stature, which uh, we know patients with achondroplasia have the average height in an adult is 132 centimetres for men and 125 centimetres for women, which is six to seven standard deviations below the average um, for healthy adults. Uh, these impairments uh, result in, these impairments affect activities of daily living, participation in sports and um, most hobbies and general interactions with society, such as the use of public facilities. Non-operative uh, treatment options include uh, the use of growth hormone. So there was a study by Hertel et al, uh, which across five years of giving daily injections found uh, a growth of between six to eight centimeters in patients. Uh, Vesoratide is a, an analog of C naturetic peptide which is a potent stimulator of endochondral ossification. It works to reduce the activity of FGFR3. Um, so this has gone through phase three clinical trials and the results were quite promising with a um, increasing uh, growth of 1.6 centimeters per year in achondroplastic children. Um, operative treatments, uh, operative treatment is a time consuming process and the indications are controversial. Um, 
it can be uh, performed on the female or the tibia. It can be done as a stage procedure, often at age seven and age 12, um, where a total duration for surgery and post-operative therapy may be up to three years, or it can be delayed until early adolescence um, with the hope of increasing the patient's participation with the rehab process. So a study by Al Degheri et al. in 2001 of 140 patients, uh, of which 80 had achondroplasia, who had uh, femoral tibial lengthening, found an average gain in length of 20.5 centimetres uh, with a standard deviation of 4.7 centimetres with the average treatment time of 31 months. Um, important to note that 43% had complications, uh, which included fractures, early consolidation, mal malalignment, joint stiffness, and infection. Um, so to summarize, achondroplasia is the most common skeletal dysplasia. Uh, the orthopedic manifestations of this are seen in the spine and the upper and lower limbs. Uh, multidisciplinary care between orthopedics, surgeons, and pediatricians is necessary given the multi multiple areas involved. Thank you. Okay.